Welcome to Real Estate Coaching Radio, starring award-winning real estate coaches and number one international best-selling authors, Tim and Julie Harris. This is the number one daily radio show for realtors looking for a no BS, authentic, real-time coaching experience. What's really working in today's market, how to generate more leads, make more money, and have more time for what you love in your life. And now your hosts, Tim and Julie Harris. Welcome back. It's day three of Ready for Your Mindset and Money Upgrade. And we really love all the great feedback we've been getting on this topic. And it, frankly, I'm thrilled that so many of you are finding so much of this information useful. And I'm going to start out by telling you guys a little story. And this is, I think, in perfect alignment with, um, you know, frankly, a lot of experiences a lot of folks are having now, especially post-election. So I had this exact same question come from coaching clients, past coaching clients, and even one of our coaches asked me this question, how to really ultimately get control of how you react emotionally to different things that are occurring on a regular basis in your life. Um, And that's such a good question. And there actually is a formula for it that's not that difficult, right? So here's what it is. You got to understand that inside all of us we have, and I'm going to make this as simple as possible. Um, is we have something inside of us that causes us to go into a state of fight or a state of, uh, a state of flight. So you either basically you had, you know, it's hardwired into all of us. It's part of our brainstem, all these, you know, I can come up with some physiological uh, explanations as far as what's going on. But again, just for the sake of brevity, you either go into fight or flight when you're faced with something that is emotionally or physically challenging, challenging to you. It's a natural reaction. But here's what's interesting. So again, Three different folks asking me the same question, and that tells me there's a lot of you that are fighting with this or trying to you know, decode all this for yourselves. When you're in a situation where you feel a visceral, and you can you know, decide what visceral, what level of visceral reaction you're experiencing, but when you're finding something you find revolting, angering, you find somebody's maybe insulting you, you find maybe a situation where you feel like you're not getting gratitude, you're being disrespected, all these sort of negative emotions. And even more so if you're coming in contact with an actual person that's causing those emotions to bubble up inside of you. I want you to just you know, understand that the, the actual physical reaction to that person or situation is out of your control, but how you choose to react to that physical reaction is in your control. So what does that free you of? It frees you up of worrying about or trying to study or decode why you think the way you think. Figuring out why you think the way you think is, a, frankly, one of the biggest wastes of time you're ever going to you know, meander into. And why is that true? Because the way you feel controls how you think. And ultimately, the way you feel changes constantly. So ultimately, ultimately, the only thing you can really control your actions, and I'll prove it to you. So let's say, for example, you have somebody in your life, and you can think of who this person is. Let's say this person's name is Bob, okay? Poor old Bob. Poor Bob. Yep. And so let's say Bob is somebody that every time you come in contact with Bob, you're just something innate inside of you that wants to punch him square in the nose. You don't really know why. Bob triggers you. Exactly. Yeah. That's a you know, modern way of explaining it, using the word trigger, right? So there's something that in, within Bob that triggers you. Or maybe there's some Republican or Democratic you know, politician, or maybe there's some... Something like that. Something is causing you to have a visceral, emotional reaction to that person or the situation. And, and, you know, the news is all about that. Social media is all about that. Now, what's happening is you are having something happen in your body that's quite natural. And again, don't worry about why you're reacting that way because it's really, it's too much to try to figure out. No, I've never really known anyone to figure it out, even when they claim that they have, you know. But again, you can control how you react to it. So old Bob, you know, shows up on your radar. And sure enough, you're feeling that same flight or that same fight uh, feeling inside of you or flight where you want to get away from Bob. It's just an, an irrational emotional reaction. You've tried to rationalize it over the years, let's say. Maybe you just don't like the way Bob looks or maybe you don't like Bob's politics or maybe you just don't like Bob's whatever it is. You've come up with a long litany of excuses why it's okay for you just to have that visceral reaction to Bob. And again, whatever, that's fine. But here's the thing where you're maybe not realizing. You lose control and you lose power when you don't actually um, when you don't actually at least try to not have that visceral reaction continue to manifest. Because what happens is, is after you have that reaction to Bob, that same reaction then starts to grow in, in other negative ways in your life. And it could just be the people you surround yourself with. It could be the, you know, the media you attract yourself to. It could be what you decide you're not willing to do to be of service to other people. All these different things. Nothing, com- nothing goods, good comes from your, you know, your negative reaction to Bob. Nothing. Now, 
Look for the feeling inside of you. So here it is. You're thinking of Bob or think of whoever it is in your life that you feel this way towards. So when you, it's usually like an egotistical type person or somebody that, you know, oh my gosh, that person is so, they think so much of themselves or they're so dismissive or disrespectful or, or just those things. So when you have that person and you're visualizing them in your head, and I'm going to give you a relief valve in here in a second, because some of you are boiling up, I can feel it. So allow yourself to feel the feelings of being around that person. Okay, now you feel them. Where are they manifesting inside of you? Maybe it happened so fast. But generally speaking, where they actually start, and I mean this in a you know biological, physiological way, is in basically dead center, right above your stomach in essence. That is, and why? Because there's glands, there's chemical things that are causing your body to, it's the very, very beginning stages of fight or flight. And if you can feel that, the next time you think of Bob or whoever it is, and you start and you just don't try to stop the feelings how you feel, don't question why you feel the way you feel, none of those things. Just look for the feeling that you have when you're thinking or around Bob and observe them. That's it. Oh, there it is. Here comes Bob. I'm going to wait and for, maybe it's already happening, right? But here comes Bob. How am I feeling? Where is that feeling manifesting? Where did it actually start inside my body? And then you just observe it because here's the magic. And I want you to just remember what I said and just please try to practice this because it will give you an immense, amazing, unbelievable sense of control and freedom because you no longer have to be, you guys remember in psychology 101 when you were in college or maybe you studied this in high school where there was, I think it was Pavlov that was ringing the bell and the dog started to slobber. They trained the dog to slobber just by the sound of the bell. Well, you're doing the same thing when you react so easily to some of these other things in people, right? So you're around Bob. Bob is causing you to feel triggered. Look for that feeling and then just observe it. Don't try to stop it. Don't try to question it. Don't try to rationalize it. Don't try to anything. Just observe it. Just look at it. Almost like you're looking at yourself in a Petri dish and you're the little thing dancing around in the Petri dish. And you're going to then notice a couple things. First of all, when you become the observer of this particular thing that's inside of you, that's causing you to react emotionally then you can then instantly, as soon as it is seen, it stops. So the vitriol you had manifested over time towards Bob, right, is now no longer involuntary. It's now something that you observe. And as such, you actually stop feeling that way. Now, here's what's really magical. When Bob is around you and he, and maybe it takes a few times, notices that you're not getting your back hunched up, your hair's not on end, right? You're not essentially feeling like you're in that fight or flight mode because he can sense that in you. And when he no longer senses that in you, what's going to happen and it's happened, I pray that all of you experience this, is that he stops feeling that way towards you. And all of a sudden this adversary who was no, probably didn't really earn the right to be an adversary, uh, you, you know, you to feel that way. It's sort of like, a doesn't really make sense why you feel that way. You just sort of rationalized it. Well, he stops feeling that way towards you because he's no longer reacting to your, some people will call it ego reaction to him. Now, I want you to think about what I just said, and I want to, I'm going to even make it simpler for all of you. When you are in a situation and you're hearing or feeling somebody triggering you, don't try to question it. Don't try to defend it. Don't try to go to war. Don't try to put your dukes up. Don't try to outwit them. Just observe the feeling where it's manifesting inside of you. Just look at it. Oh, there it is. I feel that feeling in my center of my, you know, my body. And then just by observing it, you'll notice the feeling goes away almost instantly. So what do you do with all this information? What you realize after you've experienced this, you only have to really experience being, you know, observing this sort of negative thing that manifests in all of us. And I, personally, I think it's a, you know, incarnation of evil, if you want to know what I actually think what it is, because nothing positive comes from it. But, you know, and it's an involuntary thing. And really, I think a lot of media nowadays is designed around essentially eliciting that feeling inside of humans, because then you're manipulatable. Because if I get you to believe, for example, one political side is evil, you know, and the other is good or just whatever, if I get you actually to believe that and you're not in control of your emotional reaction... Who's in control? The media's in control. I'm in control. If the government or you know a, a business or anything else can get you to worry about a particular thing and they know how to trigger you to the point where you're not mentally and emotionally and spiritually in control how you react, you're not in control. You're just a lemming. 
You're going to buy what they want you to buy, vote who they want you to vote for. You're going to think the thoughts that they want you to have. But if you become the observer of that manifestation inside of you, it, just watching it, not judging it, not giving it any power, not questioning it, not saying, well, it's because I got beat on when I was a little kid or you know, because I didn't get enough strawberry ice cream on my third birthday, all these things. Nope, don't do any of that. Just observe the emotion and then it ceases to have power over you and you then become somebody completely different because you're now in control of how you're going to react to certain situations. Now, you'll fumble sometimes. You'll slip up. That's normal. You're human. Forgive yourself for that and then get back to processing that and practicing that internal you know, barometer of how you're feeling to different people. And once you've done it once, and this is the magic of it, I promise you, once you've actually done it once, uh, after that, it becomes very easy two or three or four more times after that. And then it's going to be almost impossible for somebody or something to trigger you. I'll tell you though, the only people that really can trigger you once you're consciously aware of this, uh, frankly, this, uh, I think this, this power that you have, yeah, the power that all of us have are the people that are the closest to you because, you know, frankly, you allow them into, you know, they're, you know, they pass through more filters faster. And sometimes if they're having a bad day or if they say things that are, you know, triggering to you, you won't necessarily be able to stop yourself as fast from reacting. But other than that, I mean, I'm guilty of that occasionally for sure. And Julie's definitely guilty of that. <laughs> I think we are. Yeah. I, I've had coaching calls where uh, team leaders whose family works with them or for them, um, we talk about the fact that because they're close to you, they probably take a little bit more leeway. You probably give each other a longer leash most of the time. And then every now and then there'll be a snapping. So in essence, practice on what we're talking about. Think about what we said. And if you find yourself in an emotional state that you don't like, that you're realizing is now allowing you to manifest the things in your life that you want, and you're not attracting to, uh, people to you in your life, friends, family members, you know, real estate clients, or the, an, an abundance and the quality that you're looking for, you cannot blame anything external. You've got to look inside because you might be unwittingly uh, being constantly triggered to act and think in a certain way that's running the people that you truly want in your life. You're running them off. So do take all this into consideration and do some self-work on this because it is incredibly rewarding. And again, I had this question, various variations on this question. I know it's because the election just happened yeah. and I know a lot of people are dealing with how to deal with people, you know, and guess what? We're going into the holidays, which are always full of a lot of stress. Hey, there's, you know, uncle whoever who you haven't seen forever. And the last time you saw him, he was really disgusting. And now you have to sit across from him at Thanksgiving. Who thought that up? Whose fault is that? Right? <laughs> I know. It, it definitely comes out during the holidays, and the holidays uh, after a contentious election just throws fuel on those flames, doesn't it? Well, but, you know, I, you know, along those lines, these people that are coming out with crib notes for you to take to your Thanksgiving dinner. Oh, my gosh. So you can talk down the liberal or the lefty or the conservative, the Trumpian or whoever the hell it is. You've got to realize how nasty. I'm going to tell them about something else. Okay. All right. So I've got a podcast that I listen to that I guarantee you none of you guys listen to. It's an automotive uh, podcast. Julie's laughing at me because I, I know. Yes, I know. This is all related. Yeah. Well, it's okay. It's all right. We so, can so she, uh, this, this podcast in particular, Jerry Seinfeld's on it occasionally. Um, and I listen to it occasionally. And the podcast is automotive based. That's my hobby. Some of you guys know. Yes, you can feel sorry for me. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so um, I'm noticing that they're becoming more and more political in their views. And I won't say what side of the aisle that they're on. But it's becoming to the point where it's really unlistenable because they're just acting at such low class and so just disgusting. It just is really it, – it's unreal, really. And that's not what you what you started listening to them about anyway. So I, I messaged them and I said, you know, here's the thing. Um, I realize it's your podcast and Julie and I have a podcast and the whole thing, but maybe you need to take into consideration how expansive your audience could be if you didn't. Well, I mean, there's no sense in me telling the story without telling the whole story. So these guys were very left leaning on their podcast and it didn't come out that frequently, but now it's coming out all the time. And look, I don't care what their political leanings are. I'm there to listen to, you know, car banter, uh, but it's getting to the point where it's unlistable and they're just being absolutely nasty. And I, you know, messaged him and I said, so you might want to take into consideration that after the election, it kind of proves out that most of the country, a majority of the country, you know, voted on the opposite side of, of the, you know, people that maybe you're not realizing you're, you know, you're trying to attract or just saying whatever you're saying, just the whole thing. And he gets back to me and we had kind of a fun exchange. I'll let Julie listen to it or read it rather. He gets back to me and basically tells me to F off. 
So it's his creative thing. And he's going to say wherever the hell he says. He's going to say however he wants to say it. To which I said, I, you know, respect that. I understand completely. And I, you know, I'm just maybe just trying to help you guys realize that you're running, potentially running a lot of people off. And um, th- he kind of calmed down in his text. And then he told me something that's made a kind of a profound impact on me. And I've been thinking about it since yesterday. So he's been in the media uh, business for like 30 years. He used to be a writer. Spike Ferrison is who I'm talking about. So he used to be a writer for Jerry Seinfeld. And he's an, a really great writer. If you, you remember the Soup Nazi, Julie? Did he write that? He wrote that. <laughs> yeah, so one funny. of the greatest Seinfeld episodes. So the guy's totally. got some real skills, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. And the, the movie that Jerry just came out with. the um, oh, the Pop-Tart movie? Yeah. The, that he, is hilarious. He was a co-writer on that one, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. All right. So um, <laughs> that's who I'm talking to. So, so he basically said something that really got me thinking. He said, in essence, he said, he said, Tim, you don't know anything about the entertainment industry. And you're always right. I know nothing sure. about the entertainment Fair industry. Enough. So that's when I realized really what I was missing is he's talking politics because he's trying to be entertaining. <laughs> he's not talking politics for any other reason other than the same reason that everyone, that essentially all the media outlets have become entertainers. And all they're doing is they're feeding people uh, what they want to hear. They're just trying to entertain them. That's the reason these late night, uh, you know, uh, air quoting comedians mm-hmm. have all become so political because all they're doing is they're talk- They're essentially talking about stuff that entertains their audience. They don't really care about political this and political that or what's right for this and right for that or wrong for this, right? You know, they're just trying to entertain people and they're doing it in such a you know a way that frankly i think is inappropriate that you know whatever it's that is spike said correctly i'm not in the entertainment business and he knows his audience and his audience maybe thinks that kind of banter is entertaining you know what the hell do i know could be. but then i expanded that and this is what mm-hmm. julie and i talked about last night maybe that's exactly what's happened to all of the news <laughs> the news and and basically all forms of media that we call them political channels or news channels but they're not not they're anymore. just they're just mediocre entertainers. Yeah, trying to get sometimes people. entertaining themselves. I think. But, totally. I mean, if you look at the viewership and the listenership, I think that is true. Well, I mean, there was a, a report that you know all kinds of things, but that's so for me realizing that is really was very interesting because that's what essentially all of these institutions that we grow up with knowing and trusting have become. They just become clickbaity garbage pits. And I didn't realize to until Spike kind of led me to kind of shown the light on the fact that we're all in the entertainment industry. It wasn't until he said that in such a direct way, which I sincerely appreciated, uh, that I realized that all of it's basically fake. Mm-hmm. It's all designed basically to, to give you guys a little puppet show, to make everyone want to watch so that they can sell ads, so they can make money. Nothing that we – and they're leveraging and taking advantage of the fact that we're all very trusting – easily fooled people because we grew up listening to Walter Cronkite or maybe you're Dan Rather's generation. I don't know. And you believe those, you know, it's funny. I say Dan Rather. Mm -hmm. Do you know that Dan Rather quit CBS news Mm -hmm. after a 60 minute story he did where one of his interns, one of his staff staff members Mm -hmm. did a slight misquote of George, of the president then, which is George W. Bush. Mm -hmm. So he was so embarrassed that he didn't uphold these journalistic standards by what would it nowadays, no one even would have pointed it out right. because now they're misquoting constantly. So when you hear the politicians and these news reporters say things that they must know is a lie or a misquote, they're not reporting news. They're not trying to be factual. They're just trying to entertain you. Yes, that's a really key, important point to realize. And it goes back to your previous point about maintaining control of your thought process, maintain, maintain control of your mindset. What, what's going into your head? What are you believing and why? And, you know, it, it's a lot of work to not just go through life and believe in the thing, especially some of these things. Like, I think what happened with you on listening to that podcast is you had gotten into the habit of listening for automotive content and you liked him as a writer and that was your expectation. Well, mostly Jerry Seinfeld, if we're being and, honest. Uh, and yeah. it's fun to listen to Jerry, <laughs> yeah, too. Yeah, definitely. But, well, Jerry's never yeah. political either. Well, and maybe there's a lesson in that. Yeah, hell know. yeah. You know, but I, I think that's interesting that we have to all be frosty and put it through these filters that, you know, what are we trying to come across on our podcast? We're trying to educate you, motivate well, you, and get you into action. We've been pretty clear about that. Let's let's just stay on this, okay? Sure. So if your job, like what their job is to entertain you, and they know that essentially, let's say, the, the uh, his audience is red and half of it's blue or the potential. So he's going to decide who he's going to try to appeal to. 
he could decide to try to appeal to everybody and just stay apolitical, or he could decide to double down and basically try to appeal to the red or the blue side, right? So he's making a choice that he's going to uh, cater his content and what he says and how he says it to entertain a specific part of people, not because he's really discussing political things. He's just trying to placate this very you know, malleable, malleable audience mm -hmm. into wanting to listen. Thus they click and he sells more ads and, you know, mattresses and Viagra and wherever yeah. the hell else he's sure. selling. But I think that's very fascinating, honestly, mm -hmm. because e when you think of it like that and you forget, just forget the label, this is a news channel or this is a whatever, and you see them for what they really are, then it actually, again, is liberating mm -hmm. because you don't, you no longer are holding them to a higher journalistic standard because they're not journalists. Because And so now you feel liberated because you have adjusted your expectations, right? Which is, it was very low before, but now it's like zilch, <laughs> honestly. Really well, so the big yeah. movement now is sure. a lot of people are starting to do, which is incredible, podcasts. Yes. And I, if yeah. you look, if you look at the last round of polit a political, or, you know, the last presidential round, the podcasts prevailed where what everyone was talking about nobody was talking about this really amazing interview on msnbc or fox news they're talking about podcasts that people were on and that's where people are now announcing their you know essentially their intentions and whatever why are they doing that because it's unfiltered like you know joe rogan okay why do you hate him if you hate him have you listened to his podcast or do you just believe what other people said about him you should listen to him because i got news for you He's not really very conservative in most of his views. I think he's he's fairly well balanced. The thing about Joe and I, I mean, to me, he's mostly a dude's podcast because he has you know wrestling on and he has hunting on and stuff like that. But he has a big variety, and I listen to and I like some of Joe's podcasts mainly because he asks really great questions. It's a longer form podcast, so you, I, I think. For me, the second or third half hour is better because he gets people to sort of calm down. Well, that's the point. He brings out some real conversation. He brings out some real thought without, he doesn't generally get combative with people. I mean, no, occasionally, he never does. but no, 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 but he that's never not does. his thing, you know? Well, so yeah, moral of the story here is, is when you're deciding to be yourself as the best version of yourself as a real estate practitioner, I realize that some of you are, and I've had uh, coaching clients uh, have pointed this out to me and I agree with them. That if you aren't 100% firmly entrenched in one side of the aisle politically or the other, and your entire marketplace is, you know, and you're not, or you're trying to be neutral, or you're, you know, being a renegade and you're trying to be the opposite of what the vast majority of your community supports or think is true, you're probably going to be ostracized and you're probably not going to do any real estate deals. So in some cases, you're going to have to basically appeal to the ready audience that you in the marketplace in which you've chosen to participate. I get it. That's called when in Rome, right? Well, when in Rome, you know, and, and to, again, to put position yourself mentally and emotionally to essentially try to be the bearer of your version of the truth. I'm not saying you're not right about that. For example, I just you know said I can understand why Spike was doing it, but Spike was doing it as a version of expression for himself. He did say that, but also because it's the ready, willing, and audience he's decided to try to appeal to. Whether he truly holds those views or not, you know, it's so fascinating. I hope everybody is paying attention to all the nasty, horrible things that were said during this last election cycle, and look how none of them are saying it anymore. Yeah. I mean, what 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 happened to this, the 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 fear and loathing that we had for each other? Well, why is it all a not week ago. Be, a week ago? What happened to all of it? It was all fake. Yeah, it was all designed to put you in a state of fight or flight. All designed to take advantage of the fact that you weren't monitoring the fact that you were being manipulated, trying to get you to be, go in this state of fear, so you would basically vote one way or the other. And I have to say, I am so thrilled with the fact that people are waking up and they are, uh, you know, going for more in-depth uh, sources for information. Podcasts, for example. Yeah, you know, and, podcasts and, do keep you in control of your content. Well, exactly. And I, I, this is fascinating too. So you got to wonder why podcasts are impossible to cancel. Mm -hmm. Like you, people on YouTube and on, uh, even some of the social media, well, all the social media platforms, mm -hmm. if they were not in alignment with whatever the zeitgeist was of the, you know, the, your Whatever. show would get canceled. Yeah. Your show could get canceled or not searchable. This has been proven in Congress that this is what was happening during COVID and all the rest of it. But they couldn't mess with podcasts because podcasts as an audio source is almost impossible to govern. It's almost impossible to limit. And so the true free speech that's happening in America right now is largely happening on podcasts. And I guess maybe as a side note from my sort of uh, involved rant 
is that you might want to consider starting your own podcast and you might want to start allowing your voice to be heard and internalize some of the things that we talked about. But ultimately, what has to happen in our country, and I do believe it is going to happen in our country, is we're all going to let ourselves go from all these labels that have been given to all of us, and we're all going to come together again as a country. Because we are so blessed. Frankly, we're all blessed to be in the real estate industry, especially with brewing up to happen starting next year as far as the real estate market. But we're also so blessed to live in this country and at the time in which we're living it. There's going to be so many healthcare and AI and all these things that are all going to start, you know, we're going to start experiencing those and feeling all those things uh, starting probably in earnest within the next six months. You already have. I mean, all of you who have been on sitting on the sidelines waiting to do all your YouTubes and your videos and your all these things, well, you probably have waited for the right amount of time because you're going to soon discover that it's going to be so easy to automate in all of the social media, automate all the things. And what we're going to see is all the grinding out, time-sucking, laborious work that has consumed so many of your work days is all going to be automated to AI. All, and you're then going to be able to spend your time being of service to other people, having direct, meaningful conversations. And that's the way that you're going to stay relevant in real estate forever. There's never going to be a world without doctors. There's going to be AI that actually will do a lot of the doctor's work, but you're still going to meet with, AI is going to say, this is your problem, this is your solution. You're still going to want to meet with a doctor. That's going to happen in law. That's going to happen in real estate. The human brain is designed to want to have a, a, a big kumba, right? Mm -hmm. Essentially give you a, a authoritative blessing to whatever decision you're trying to make with regards to this stressful thing, buying or selling real estate, for example. That's what you are if you earn the right to be. And so you've got it. And the only way you're going to leave room in your heart for wanting to be of service to other people at that level continuously is if you really, you have to get in control of what you're allowing yourself to be triggered by. And hopefully, you know, what I just shared with you guys will be beneficial. Yeah. I mean, it gets back to controlling the things that you can control, recognizing the things that you don't want in your mind and your psychology, letting go of those things. And to reel it back into our topic du jour, well, showing Julie, some listen. gratitude. They can get the notes because right. we've talked for a while. But I think that the thing that gets you back on track are some of these gratitude points that we've shared with you over the past three days so that you get into that habit. And you remember it, when we started the series, you were talking a lot about you get back what you put out there, right? Well, you, you want grat – so if you, if you write down the negative emotions that you're feeling right now um, – and this is – actually, I did this exercise with somebody the other day. And I asked them to write down what they're feeling. And they fought me with it because they didn't want to let it go. They didn't want to say the words out loud because then they'd have to sort of resolve them. But it was a lot of really nasty things they thought about themselves. They found themselves – they thought they were unattractive physically – they thought they were not getting appreciated, and this person in particular felt they were passed over at their brokerage or some award. They weren't, you know, there were some issues with their spouse, and they weren't necessarily feeling like they're, I'm trying not to say he or she because they're listening, and I don't want them to, you know, feel like I'm talking at a church here. All those things. I had them all write them down, and then I asked them the very, the, the first question I asked is, how do you know those things are true? And then, you know, how do you know those things are true that you're, you know, essentially what you think is what people are imposing upon you is true. How do you know that's actually true? Do you think there's an organized cabal of people that are trying to basically make you feel terrible about how you look? And then the next question is, is who would you be if you no longer felt that way? And that lets it go. Who would you be if you no longer felt that way? Because then what you're doing is you're unplugging from that constant reinforcement cycle of those negative emotions. Because those negative emotions, you've been carrying around for years and for decades. And it all goes back to that internal triggering you're just in a habit. So how do you actually move beyond all this? Look, every self-help book, I have to say, this is funny. So Julie and I, when we go to Barnes and Nobles, there's not one in Puerto Rico, but when we go to Barnes and Nobles and we travel. So our book is almost always on the opposite side of the long aisle of self-improvement books. Yeah. So on one side, you'll have like a football field of self-improvement books, it's true. which are all basically about the same thing. And the opposite side, you'll have our book. And last time I looked, wasn't our book next to something called Crypto Dad? Crypto Dad, yeah. <laughs> it's kind of in the business section, but it's next to the self-improvement section. Right. Well, yeah. the thing, is, I, every yeah. time I see that, I always think to myself, boy, we are dumbasses. We should have read a self-improvement book because clearly there's a huge Seriously. demand for it. But what all those self-improvement books are trying to do is get you to solve the impossible uh, problem, which is trying to figure out why you think the way you think. And I'm here to liberate you from that and tell you the truth who cares you're never going to figure it out because it's all very intertwined and all kinds of things that don't really need to be solved 
Here's the only thing ultimately you need to do is use the little mechanism I gave you to stop yourself from being triggered. Just all you have to do is observe it. You don't have to overthink it. As soon as you're in observance of that particular emotion of feeling rejected, angered, triggered, threatened, whatever it is, as soon as you observe it, then you're going to stop feeling it. It's not even, there's no process to it. All you've got to do is look at it and you've got to uh, essentially acknowledge it. Now, what do you do after that? You're going to have to realize that you're just in the habit of having those thoughts. You're in the habit of feeling that way about yourself. You're in the habit of thinking about yourself. So it's scary. And I'll tell you why. And the person I was talking about, um, where I made and made that sort of their own personal shit list, basically, as soon as you realize that you're in control of it, as soon as you realize you can change it, you would think, well, that would be the greatest thing ever. I can then stop thinking and feeling that way. That is not how most people think and feel because what you're, it's the red, blue, red pill, blue pill thing, mm-hmm. right? As soon as you're given the freedom to choose your emotional mental state, most people don't want it. They honestly, they don't know what to do with it because on the other side of that realization is a, is a, a chasm of unfamiliarity. That's right. Because they built their lives around so many of these habits that reinforce those ways of thinking. Well, and feelings can be habits, can't they? Oh, they definitely are. And your thoughts are habits. And you can get stuck in that hamster wheel of having the same thoughts and the same feelings. And and I want to go back to what you said. But drill down on what you just said. Sure. Because you almost said the last part correct. So you said the whole part. People, it's been proven, have the same thoughts and the same feelings at virtually the exact same time of day every single freaking day. That's right. Every day is like Groundhog Day. Every single day, you're feeling almost the exact same and you're reinforcing it by what you're exposing yourself to, the news media, the people you're around, your, your, what you eat, what you drink, all, all these habits. things. You're just yeah. constantly reinforcing it. But when you realize that you're actually in control of it, if you don't like how you look, feel, think, if you feel unappreciated, if you feel unloved, if you feel unsuccessful, all those things, you're in control of that. And it starts with basically realizing that, you know, just look for that feeling, look for the emotion, observe it. And then when you feel it, just don't don't judge it, don't value it, don't try to decode it, just observe it, and then it stops being so powerful. You do that a few times, then you're going to be somebody that walks around, and I don't mean to sound woo-woo, mm-hmm. in a higher state of consciousness well, it is, where you're going to be, it is, where you're going to walk around a higher state of consciousness where you're not going to be so damn easily manipulated. Yeah, that's right, because when you walk around that way, it doesn't really take that much to trigger somebody. They're already on the edge, they've already had all these thoughts But it's going their on. habit to be triggered. It's their habit, right? Now, when I, because I try and you know, self-monitor some of these things. I want to go back to something that you said a second ago, which is your, your, um, talk that you had with that person that we aren't saying who they are, um, where you were, they were observing, I feel this way. I have this thought. Okay. So you had a filter, uh, like a, a decision tree to go through. What are these thoughts that you're having? So you identify that. And by the way, those of you who have studied any like child psychology, this is a developmental thing too, that not everybody has gone through. One of the reasons why, especially littler kids, come unglued and they hit a wall and they have a tantrum, they have fits, whatever, is because they're feeling out of control. And so what psychologists teach kids to do is to name that emotion, which is something you were talking about as adults, but sometimes we get away from it. Because if you just feel crazy and stressed, that's not really identifying well, Make it, it practical. So you're around somebody yeah. and that person, it's Bob again. But Bob, Bob has trouble. Bob is really good sometimes, and sometimes he is just not, nothing it but just a pot depends. stirrer. Yeah. It just is. All right, so you're around Bob, yeah. and every time you're around Bob, he just gives you the, the creeps. You just feel like he's sketched. It's creepy Bob. You don't want to be creepy Bob, right? So go through the decision tree, because I know that's what you're walking into. The same thing I said, but you've got a lot, a different version okay. of it. Hopefully you remember the so details. So you mean, so I'm going to say, I believe this about Bob, Correct. right? Okay, so I believe creepy Bob, you know, like heads in the freezer. I don't know. There's something about Bob, right? These are my thoughts. And every time I see him, I'm like, oh my gosh, it's getting creepier all the time. Okay. So that's the first thing is identify what is it that you're thinking? Bob hates me. Bob is not like, Bob is mean to me. Bob makes me feel like he's going to, you know, put He'll my head. He'll never in- take my call. He's ghosting me. All of these things. Right. Okay, so you identify what it is that you're thinking. Then you ask yourself, is that actually true? Well, how would you know if it's true? Maybe you're completely off base. Maybe you're believing something about Bob. Because somebody told you something about Bob. Let's even make this more practical, okay? Sure. Um, using Bob's as an example makes me feel guilty for all the Bobs that are listening. <laughs> I, I got yeah. one that's really practical. Okay. I'm too old to be successful. I'm too young Fair to be enough. successful. Mm-hmm. I'm not smart enough to be successful. 
Um, I'm not pretty enough to be successful. I'm not whatever, whatever, I don't have whatever. The experience so let, that. let's pick. Let's yeah. pick the one that's probably most relevant to most of our listeners. I'm too old to be successful. My past days are behind me. Yeah. Walk through it. Okay. All, all the best stuff is behind me. All right. So that's what you believe. Is it absolutely true? How do you know if it's true? How do you know if it's true? You got to be introspective. Maybe you have zero evidence. It's just a bad thought habit that you've gotten into. I had Maybe some... your eighth grade teacher told you that you were a loser and you've believed that since eighth grade and you've held on to that and never done anything about well, it. Well, when we were growing up, Julie, most of the people in Columbus, Ohio, by the time they reached 40 career-wise, the whole world was telling them that you're past prime and you better start yeah. scaling down. I haven't made it yet. And, and yeah. I was on the phone with somebody on Zoom, actually, and she mm-hmm. was 59 and she basically said, essentially, that she thought her past days were behind her, to which I then asked her, well, how do you know if that's true? And she didn't know if it was true. And then I rattled off some of the most successful people in the history of history yeah. who didn't accomplish. By the way, guys, most people don't become truly successful until they're in their 50s or 60s. Yeah. Most people don't become millionaires until they're in their 50s or 60s. It takes a while. We've talked about all this on the podcast, right? So most people don't reach their career peaks until they're, in their, until they're older. But if you believe you're too old to be successful and you're only 40, guess what you're going to create in your life? Yes. Yeah, so here's the thing. If you don't have an answer to... How do you know that's true? It's probably not true. So the third question is, who are you right now because you've been believing this? And the fourth question is, and you touched on this for a second, is if you let that go and you stop believing that, then who do you become? Right. And so, that's opening the door. That's creating that chasm that you talked about that makes people uncomfortable sometimes. I'm not, uh, I'm too young to be successful. Let's walk through it. Ask me the questions. So how do you know that? Is that true? Um, well, I don't know of anybody. I'm only 25 or I'm 23, let's say. I mean, you and I started selling real estate when we were basically 22 and 23. So, I, I mean, and we certainly, everyone accused us of being too young. Sure. You know, we, had, we heard that constantly. But was it actually true? Well, but how did we validate that it wasn't true? Because we found other people. Now, granted, there are in other parts of the country. But they do exist. Ryan Searle in Colorado in particular, we drove yep. out to visit with him. He was selling 300 plus homes per year. Yep. And he was exactly our age. Yes. And so we knew that wasn't true. We knew you could actually be successful despite our age, even though all of our competitors, when we started selling We're real estate. We're twice our age, <laughs> basically. Yeah, basically twice yeah. our age. Yeah. Yeah. So keep so, going. So we found people to unvalidate that previous belief. And that was the end of it. But if you don't find that, uh, if you don't actually seek out, it could be books, by the way, or it could be podcasts, it could be biographies, it could be real people that unvalidate your first belief about yourself, then you're going to continually believe it. And like, for example, okay, let's go about it without having the Ryan example. Mm -hmm. So I don't, we're too young to be successful in real estate. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, is that actually true? Well, I mean, I don't know if anyone else is successful in real estate, so it must be true. So what do you go, that's a place to stop. Now, what do you do when that's the case? Because you have a choice now to continue to believe that or to be introspective and go out and find out if you're wrong. But here's what happens, and especially in real estate, is that what you'll do is you'll go out there and you'll start basically becoming the prey to every, oh my gosh, I have to not say a bad word, but every, <laughs> yay who? Nope, I'm going to say it. Son of a bitch okay. who's trying to take advantage of your insecurity. And, and there gonna, are a lot of them. And there are a lot of them. They're going to try to sell you. And, well, come on, Julie. You're not successful because you haven't built your brand yet. You need to buy your website, your CRM. You I've need got to, some leads to you sell gotta, you. Here's some leads. Oh, no, no, Julie. You don't understand. Everybody, when they get into real estate, they buy leads and pay 40% referral fees and make no money. That's called normal. And, oh, no, you want to list a house? Forget that. You're not listing any real estate until you've been in real estate for three or four years. And then maybe some of those buyers that you sold houses to are then going to want to list You're their houses You're going to have to earn you. your way there. And what I remember what they used to say to us when we were starting. you got to spend money to make money. Exactly. Oh, you and the other thing. Okay. So you have to make a decision. Are you going to buy your business or are you going to earn your business? And look, if you buy your business, here's the advantage. You can then spend more time doing other things and you can, you know, they they have a very elegant way of trying to get you to rationalize spending money for something that gets you essentially dubious results. You might get business from the leads that you're buying, for example, or the branding exercise or the social media thing you're doing. You might get business from it, but unless you know to actually put pen to paper and figure out how much actual profit you made from that, because in most cases, you're going to realize you would have been literally better off being a barista at Starbucks, yep. especially now that they're supposedly getting a raise like $35 an hour. Yeah, that's right. Well, and, but it's and true. And they get insurance too. But it's true. Yeah. But if you believe sure. it's true, if you believe yeah. you're too young to be successful in real estate, unless you build a brand, unless you do all these other things, unless you've actually done the work to validate that that's not true, you're going to go down the wrong path and you're probably going to fail, yep. which is ultimately what's happened to so many agents 
that have come into this industry. And that's the reason it pisses me off. Mm-hmm. Is And I'll tell you what else I'm seeing a lot of. Older agents mm-hmm. who are now internalizing the nature of the market, which is, by the way, the crappiest market since 1998. So if your business is off, well, that's called normal for reals. Now, a lot of our coaching clients, fortunately, are having your best years ever. But just thinking about all this. And so you're starting to believe the reason your business is off is because your best days are behind you. Okay, we're going to go back to that. Sure. So we're going to, you're, you're now a 56 or 57-year-old female realtor, which is our average demographic who's listening to our podcast right now. And you're believing that because you're not willing to tech, dance around on TikTok videos and do all this social media stuff, that somehow the world's going to pass you by. And that's the reason that your business is off. That's the reason, you know, you're, maybe you're not where you wanted to be financially. Well, so what, so who are you because you believe that? You're somebody who is making decisions based on that belief, aren't you? Yeah, exactly. You're starting to make decisions that your best days are behind you and you're starting to slowly or maybe quickly doubt yourself. Yeah. And so that causes you to get into bad habits. It causes, I'll tell you what I see when somebody's in that zone is they stop going after quality business because to them it's too hard to get and they're too old and they don't have the technology and they don't know how to use chat GPT or AI or any of these things. So they start working with less, when, when I say less quality business, I don't mean less quality people. They're not qualified. They're, they're just not qualified. They're not ready to buy or sell. A seller who will only sell if they get their price and their price is crazy. Buyers who want more than they can afford and keep on running you around God's green earth. They And then that agent, because they're stuck in that belief system that their best days are behind them, then they, then they start saying things like, well, you know, I, all the leads are crappy and I hate this business and well, it's too stressful. Let's give an example. It's like so, a self-fulfilling thing. Totally. And that's what happens. If you start believing it, if you actually allow those thoughts to manifest in your brain, you'll create the You reality. actually create it. So Lance Kenmore, and I'm going to talk about him because he said this on the interview I did with him, fair enough. which is a past PS. Yeah, so fair game, right? Yeah. <laughs> all right. So you guys listen to a past podcast where I interviewed is Lance. It's called now Public Domain. Yeah, <laughs> oh, totally. Okay. Oh, they do sign releases. Yeah. All right. So Lance and I are talking about the fact that he is an, he's been a, one of the top agents who I love the fact he's got such low ego. He doesn't toot his own horn. But his, his team's been selling four or five, you know, hundreds and hundreds of houses. He sold thousands of houses in his career. For a long time. And he's had Julie Harris as his coach for 15 years, 16 years. I think it's 17 now. Oh, gosh. Yeah. We're getting old, Julie. <laughs> anyway, so, you know. so his business is off like everybody else's. Right. And it's slower. And he didn't have as many listings. Weren't closings as many deals. The whole thing. And so, you know, he and I were, I was giving him this little, you know, he figured it out after a while, but coaching session during the interview. And I asked him, you know, do you track your business? I know because Julie is his coach, so he tracks his business. So what were your lead sources for your business? 60% of all my business comes from centers of influence and past clients. Yep. Makes sense. He sold thousands of homes. Chances are he's going to get repeat and referral from them. All right. So what are you doing actually to work those folks? And oh, we're mailing them and we're he's dripping them and we're doing all this lazy stuff. I said, so Lance, if you wanted to create, and he's trying to, you know, again, Julie gave me notes prior to the interview. He's trying to get his inventory up of listing for sale to what number? 50. Okay, 50. He wants to have a standing inventory of 50 homes for sale. So if I asked him, and he was at the time, I think like 30, 25 Something maybe. Like that. Yeah, pretty so close. I said, Lance, if you wanted to get your inventory up to 50 homes and you want to do it in the next 30 days, it's a competition. Mm-hmm. You got 30 days to get your inventory up to double your inventory. How would you do it? Even before I said the last <laughs> syllable, in my question, because he knew, knew what I was doing, because he knows yep. Tim and Julie Harris, he actually said, I'd call my centers of influence and past clients. And I said nothing. And you know what he did? He laughed at himself and he put his head down because he realized basically he'd walked into, you know. Hit nail on head. Hit nail on head. <laughs> and by the way, they're going to do it, I think, in of course. probably within two or three weeks. Well, so, yeah, exactly. And they can call him, in, you know, around the holidays especially. Mm-hmm. So he knew exactly what he had to do to increase his business. He needed to pick up the phone and do the real work of real estate. Yeah. But he had lulled into complacency. Sure. So, you know, why was he lulled into complacency? Who cares? It doesn't matter. I, I tell coaching clients all the time. You don't get to have a reason. We're not going to spend endless coaching time on reasons. Just get into action. Exactly. As our old broker, Rory, used to always say, take a new listing, see how you feel. That's the cure. But Julie, that is kind of a great place for us to round the bend on these different topics we talked about today. Because always, it's not about thinking and planning and plotting and creating graphs and Venn diagrams and all the rest of it. It's about actually getting into action. And if you're going to decide, if you're trying to choose what action should you get into, oh my gosh, everyone's telling me to do different things. Here's what I'm telling you to do. And this is the truth and you will know it in your core. 
go out and having have intentional direct conversations with people about buying or selling real estate. No, not just, you know, basically doing circle prospecting to strangers. Actually start with your centers of influence and past clients. Actually do the calls to the expires the for sale by owners. If you want to know how to increase your revenue instantly and, and quickly, this time of year is the best time of year to go after expires. Go to your marketplace, have the skills, have the mindset of service and talk to the people who have their hands up in the air, practically jumping around like a, you know, sugared up three-year-old trying to get your attention and call them and offer your services as a real estate professional. And hey, what have you just done? You no longer have to learn how to master marketing and funnels and social media and all the rest of it. You're actually going directly to the doorstep, quite literally, of the person who has their hand in the air and says, yes, I want to sell my house. Why aren't you doing that work? Here, I'm going to give you guys a little, you know, takeaway homework assignment. Go to your MLS and in the comments, whether if you're on YouTube especially, put how many expireds have been in your marketplace in the last six months. And no, do not just do this little tiny micro. My your, favorite zip code. Exactly. My neighborhood of 400 homes. Nope. I want you to do the entire MLS in your region. And here's what you're going to find. Thousands of expired listings. Thousands of expired sellers that all want to release their houses. And I'm going to give you something that's hopefully going to motivate you. It's, again, this is probably about 10-year-old information, but I'm sure it's still true. 90% of all expired sellers will sell their home within six months of it expiring. They all relist, even though they might say something when you call them. If you don't have the skill set, you know, you'll learn all these things. 90% of them relist, and most of them, when they relist, begrudgingly relist with their previous agent because they don't know another realtor. How about that? <laughs> That's great because you haven't talked to them yet. Right? I mean, this yeah. is what we teach you in Premier Coaching. So if you're wanting to really move past some of the negative emotions and really the absolute misperceptions you have about yourself and your potential on this planet as a real estate professional, you really need to give yourself permission to be uncomfortable, allowing yourself to step aside, is to really move out of your life all this sort of negative feedback loops that we have normalized. You need to accept the fact that your best years, and I do not care how old you are, because that's what people always try to hit me over sure. the head with, yep. are in front of you, because they are. We've had coaching clients in their 70s and their 80s who basically wanted to, you know, have more experiences in their lives. We've had a lot of people that basically wanted to um, donate more money to charity or having a meaningful impact um, and they had, you know, frankly, they never felt like they did it in a meaningful way. So now someone in their 70s or 80s, they're going to do that. They're going to contribute to an orphanage. They're going to help build a church. They're going to do something that makes it so the impact that they leave on planet Earth is something that they can really go to their graves, unbelievably proud of themselves, and leave a, frankly, leave the breadcrumbs for other people to follow. No, when they pass away and they're over 100, right? So no <laughs> one's... <laughs> you got Nothing soon. Well, you know what? And we have quite a few coaching clients that are, you know... In, in those age groups, but here's what they do have that I, you know, sometimes I have to remind them of this. They have experience. They have life experience. They have business experience. That is a huge separator between them and some of the, the younger up and comers. And they forget about it because, you know, they've been going through their life's, you know, changes and, and opportunities. And when you're living it, you don't see it as much until you put yourself out there and maybe you have to compete for a listing and you come off such a higher level because of your experience. And then they get excited. They get motivated again. They want to help more people. They get their head screwed on straight. They use affirmations like, if it's meant to be, it's up to me. I'm a doer. I do things now. I get things done. So when I was analyzing why I was trying to even suggest to Spike, why he stops <laughs> yeah. being, and then I realized that he's just trying to entertain folks. I, I'll tell you the conclusion I came to. I'm not going to act like he acts. I'm not just going to say things to try to trigger you guys, to try to take advantage of your unconscious states. I think that's evil. That's what I truly think. Yeah. And there's no way we're going to do it. Nope. We're going to do everything in our power to fight you, fight your internal ego and your everything to get you to wake up and realize your highest, truest purpose on this planet probably hasn't even been remotely realized yet. Your best days are in front of you. So we're not going to just say political things to try to get you to salivate like the, the dog hearing the bell ring. We're not going to do it. We're going to say things and do things things to try to elevate you, to try to elevate your life, try to improve your perceptions of yourself, but also essentially try to improve the perceptions and improve the qualities of lives of the people around you. That is our highest and truest purpose on this planet. That is what our mission is. And thank you for allowing us to continue to do so. This is so not the content we prepared for today. <laughs> I know. 
<laughs> you know, you screen could, is gun blank. <laughs> okay, you could do this on Monday if you wanted to. If you wanted to reuse the content, I, have, I may do that. Yes. Or, but or, they can get the notes too. Yeah. So if you want today's podcast notes, which are not what we talked about today, <laughs> uh, just you ha- out of curiosity, if nothing else. <laughs> right. Exactly. Subscribe to HarrisRealEstateDaily.com, and you'll get all of the notes as well as all of our past podcasts and videos and some unique content. Harris Real Estate Daily is our way of saying thank you to all of our podcast listeners, our regular podcast listeners for keeping this and everyone listen to daily podcast real estate professionals. So this time of year, we'll get probably five or 6,000 daily downloads. And during, say, for example, April, spring and summer months, on average, we'll average probably 10 to 15,000 per day. And we, you know, there's normal pod, because people's, uh, a bit, you know, people listen to us while they're working out or while they're going to work. But this time of year, their schedules aren't the same as they normally would be when they were working. So, you know, routines are a sure. big and paramount importance to can, your podcast downloads, really. Mm-hmm. So moral of the story is, is that that tells me there are a lot of people out there that want to actually embrace the fact that they haven't even gotten close to the life that they can have. And it's not just about material things and buying all that. It's about how you feel about yourself. It's about how much in alignment you are with your soul. And that is really what hopefully you guys are taking away from today's show. That's right. So if it's meant to you, you, it's, you know, if it's meant to be, it's time to get to work, you guys. Our job is to educate you, motivate you, and get you into action as we have promised and I think that we kind of talked our way through all of that to let them know what's going on in our minds now and then. And we'll probably have podcasts like this where we work through some of those thoughts. Well, yeah, exactly. That's what we were doing. That, that was That's basically... That's what we were doing. But we're... <laughs> guys, it's not too late. You can still have the life of your dreams. I really, you know, I believe that having, most of our listeners are real estate professionals, having a real estate license is, I mean, it's like the golden ticket because Truly. it's up to you. You're in control. To me, there's nothing worse than like having a job where it's somebody else's control. That's terrible. I know that some people that have jobs are scared of doing what you guys do. But Julie, stay on that just for a second. So you just said something else that I've been thinking about. Most people will like, they want to have something telling them how to think and feel. Sure. Because they're uncomfortable figuring out how to think and feel themselves. They want to have that, that essentially that almost paternalistic a thing that's telling them to think this way or think that way. Well, they don't have to do the work. Well, they don't have to do the work, but it's become so normal. The habit is to look at the news feed, to look at Facebook, to read this, to read the other thing, to tell you how you're supposed to feel that particular day. You guys realize you're doing that, right? You're giving away your control every time you do that. You're giving away your life. You're giving away your time. You're giving away, you know, your whole purpose on this planet. You're just giving it away. In I'll let's just end with this, Julie. Sure. A gift you can give to yourself is going media free. Do it for the holidays. Do it for the sake of your own mental health. Do it for the sake of your spiritual health. Do it for the sake of your potential. Completely stop paying attention to any of the news. Go completely cold turkey on all of it. And you will notice you're going to go through the same stages of withdrawal that you went through maybe the last time you tried to get off caffeine, which I don't know why Ann would, but you know, but you guys get the point, right? So you're going to go through little physical feelings of withdrawal, of insecurity when you get off media. But on the other side of that, and and here's the reason that a lot of people revert back to the old bad habits of essentially allowing media to tell them how to think and feel because they don't have them, uh, they don't have the foresight and they don't have a plan and how to fill the chasm. Because if all of a sudden you're not spending 10 hours a day paying attention to social media, paying attention to all this manipulation that's all around us, what are you going to do with that time? And you don't have an answer. And a lot of people fall back into those negative habits. And it's reinforced with the people that they talk to, their friends, the people at the office, all this. So you're constantly caught in this always absolutely downward spiral churning adult failure spiral and you have to dig yourself out and the best way to do it is just go cold turkey and realize the negative horrible evil effect it's having on your life and the people around you and let's end with that julie you got and it. again guys please do consider sharing our podcast with other folks and give us a five-star review if you think we merit it over on itunes in the meantime have a fantastic day we'll talk to you on the show tomorrow This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.